Good morning, Good morning. and welcome. Please come in, and I don't know if you want to shut the doors or not. It's kind of nice to have fresh air. I am Sally Fox. I am an elder elder here in the church. <laughs> There's a tie with one of us other elders in the church, but we're real close. Just lots of church news this morning. Um, sad news is Meryl Kaufman passed away this morning. So our prayers go to Eve and their family. And just, we've been praying for them for so long, so we continue to pray, pray for them and hold them up in prayer. On June 21st, this last week, you missed it. You had 90 seconds longer to live that day, and I hope you used those 90 seconds well. It was the longest day of the year. So every day now, it's shorter until like December 21 or 22. Um, I guess we're going to go right into the good news. Where's Grandpa and Grandma? They're down here. We have a new baby, a baby boy. His name is Kunak, born in Lima with kind of a wild story getting to the hospital and all that. We have to take your own toilet paper. You have to take your own baby blanket. You have to take everything. But the baby is fine and doing well. Next up, um, don't forget what's next up. Do we have a next up? <laughs> Christ for the city. Gary Hickson will be here next week, next Sunday. She's, he's going to preach. He's going to administer um, communion. He's a missionary, has been to 60 different countries. He's a healing pastor. What's exciting is he grew up here. His parents lived here forever. He lived here. We supported him in mission. Um, um, Seminary, and uh, just proud of Gary and glad that he gets to come back to his home and visit with us and tell us all about the work that he's been doing for years. And here is Earth a video of some of his work. Haiti. Most people say earthquake or deep poverty and voodoo. Is that what came to your mind? Ever since I was a little boy, I was always going over the fence in the backyard of my parents' property. They had a huge pile of National Geographic magazines, and I poured through each and every one of those. Well, now I've traveled to over 60 countries in the world. During one of my many travels, I had a profound experience that transformed my life forever and why I travel. The reason I travel is to heal broken hearts and restore lives. I traveled to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and nearby villages with a team from a non-governmental organization named Deep Healing International to help bring emotional healing from the effects of the earthquake. I had heard a lot about Haiti, and I've traveled to some of the poorest places on the planet, but that did not prepare me for what I saw. It was absolutely mind-blowing. I was deeply moved by seeing and living with the children orphaned from the earthquake. Poverty had been a part of Haiti for decades, but the earthquake just made everything even worse. And an estimated 3 million people were affected by the 2010 earthquake, but the Haitians continue to suffer profoundly. The world has forgotten about the earthquake, but the orphans haven't forgotten because they still live in it. We had a really cool opportunity to stay and work in an orphanage where I was training regional spiritual leaders. I was touched by the hospitality and the children were so sweet. They all amazed me, but one boy nicknamed Bob caught our attention. Despite having an intellectual disability that never stopped him from being super social, he always wanted to be with our team and seemed starved for love. The orphanage takes good care of the kids, but they can't play with or listen to every child. What Bob and all the other kids really need is a parent. The government has made it almost impossible for people to adopt them. So almost all of the 125 kids in the orphanage will never be adopted. Bob may never have a parent, but yet he has hope. He smiles on and reaches out one more time, hoping to be hugged by a complete stranger. Then I had a profound realization. I wasn't hugging Bob. Bob was hugging me. Haiti was an amazing trip. I loved immersing myself into their lives and their culture, and I'm looking forward to returning soon. 
There are still hundreds of countries I want to travel to in order to bring emotional healing. Join me on the journey. Is Kathleen coming with him, his wife? Okay. Um, I hear a, a little squeak or humming over here, a shrill sound. So I don't know if that's our communication. Don't forget fellowship right after church back here for coffee and goodies. And if you would stand for our call to worship, please. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will bow down toward your holy temple. You have exalted your name. On the day I called, you answered me. Come, let us worship.
be seated. Please join me with our confession. O Savior, we come to you because we are in need. We are slow to learn, prone to forget, and weak to climb. We are in the foothills when we could be on the mountains. We are pained by the times when we have a graceless heart, prayerless days, poverty of love, sullied conscience, wasted hours, unspent or misspent opportunities. Take the scales from our eyes and the sloth from our will. Make it our highest joy to gaze on you, meditate on you, and discern your will. Our deepest desire is to be close to you and to be part of your plan to save us and our world. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God does not leave us in our distress. God does not abandon us to our devilish decisions. While we choose to starve ourselves on a diet of our own making, which leads to spiritual deterioration, God provides us with the bread of life. Jesus says to us, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, they will live forever. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting, everlasting. We are forgiven. Amen. And now pray with me with our offering. Father God, you are indeed great beyond all we can fathom. Move within us. Give us generous hearts to honor you with our gifts and our offerings and our time. Use us for your purposes and grow your kingdom. Amen. Good morning. There are two scriptures for today that I want to focus on, but of course there are many scriptures that relate to the message for this morning. But I want to draw your attention to Psalm 25, verses 4 to 9. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, the Lord instructs sinners in the way, and God leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble the divine way. The New Testament reading is simply one verse. It's probably the best known verse of the entire Bible that is not by Christians, but by people over the wor all over the world. I'm reading the version from Matthew. This is um, chapter 7, verse 12. This is Jesus speaking. 
and everything do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. So how can I know God's will? How can you know God's will? Short answer, we can't. At least not perfectly. Now let's unpack it. I want to begin with a story. Some of you know that for decades I have participated in short-term uh, mission trips to the, uh, Guatemala to work with the Mayan people. And uh, it's always a wonderful experience. Anybody who's traveled internationally knows this. If you live among the people, it changes you. Now, there are many fa fascinating aspects to Mayan culture, but the one I want to share with you this morning has to do with their belief system. They place supreme importance on the sun, S-U-N, sun. Every building, every structure that they constructed in those pyramids that are very much akin to the um, pyramids of ancient Egypt, every building was situated on the land in such a way that you could look through the one window, basically a square cut out of uh, stone, and through the building, out a window on the other side, and the sun was either facing you or reflecting you. Every single building. Whenever the Mayans wanted to know what God's will for them was, they would consult, well, where is the sun today? Well, we Christians have our own version of son, of course, in Jesus Christ, God's son. And we can discern God's will by lining ourselves up to that light. But then what? After seeing the positioning of the sun, the Mayans had to determine what, what each positioning of the sun meant for their daily life. Christians, too, need to make that additional step and that's where it all starts to get really fuzzy. Let's start with what we know. God has already revealed the divine will about a great many things. We don't have to be puzzled about everything. We've been given the Ten Commandments. We come a long way toward understanding the will of God, even if we don't always do it, by being guided by these ten admonitions. Love God, worship God only, don't swear, worship regularly, honor the people who reared you, um, don't kill, and we know from Jesus that killing begins with hate in the heart. Don't adulterate your relationships and promises. Don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. And we already know that it is God's will that every person, indeed the whole of creation, be saved. This is the message of the entire New Testament. And for Christians, this means that we try to live truthful and kind lives and try to be available to be witnesses to the love of God through Jesus Christ to the world. Now, since we know this is God's will for the people all over, we don't have to wonder about a lot of things, like, is it okay to cheat a little? Is it okay to hold a grudge? Is it okay to get back to somebody who's hurt us? Is it okay to uh, abuse our spouse or children? We already know the answers to many questions like that. But what is God's will when we are facing daily choices. When we get individual and specific, it's not always so easy to discern. For example, is it God's will that I marry? Is it God's will that I divorce if my spouse is being abusive to me or the children? Is it God's will that I go back to school? Is it God's will that I be firm with my teenager today or be gentle? Is it God's will that I take this job or quit this job? Is it God's will that I make this investment? Is it God's will that I choose where to go on a vacation and how much to spend? Is it God's will on my day off that I spend it relaxing or tackling a project at home? Is it God's will that I undergo this medical procedure? Is it God's will that I retire this year or maybe wait a few years? Is it God w God's will that I'm supposed to be the one to care for my elderly parent? Is it God's will that I vote for this candidate or this issue 
or that candidate or that issue. The questions and choices can seem endless. And underneath it all, we're asking, what, Lord, do you want me to do today in this situation? I think there are several considerations that we can have. They're up here on the, here on the uh, screen. Four of them. The first of them being prayer and Bible. Remember Moses, after he had delivered the Ten, Ten Commandments to his people, he summed it all up with these words. Choose life, that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord God and obeying God's voice and cleaving to God. To choose life in God is the one great choice. That's the gift we have from our brothers and sisters, the Israelites. And then, reinforced, expanded exponentially by Jesus in the New Testament. Sermon on the Mount, the verse I read, do to others what you would like done to you, and further in John 13, love one another as I have loved you. I want to say an aside here. In, um, in, the, in the entire world history, every great religion has had some version of the golden rule. But it's all been said in the negative. Don't do to others what you don't want done to you. Jesus comes along, takes that same golden rule, and turns it around to the positive and says, do to others what you want done for you. It's proactive. It's engaging. The adage for the first, the former one might be, um, live and let live, but the one that Jesus given, gives, gives us is more like live and help to live. And this means making choices every day. The second consideration, common sense. We humans have been endowed with mental capacities that have been not given to the other creatures, and I want to share with you what common sense is not. There was a fellow, who used to, um, an overweight guy, who used to buy goodies on the way to work, at a, stopped at a bakery, and he would share all these goodies with the staff at break time. When over time, he decided eventually to go on a diet. And this meant that he had to devise another route to work so he wouldn't go by the bakery. All of his co-workers supported him in this change, even though it meant they wouldn't get the goodies. Well, time passes, and one day, he decides he wants to do an errand that happens to be on the same street as the bakery. So as he approaches the block where the bakery is, this is his prayer. Lord, if you want me to stop at this bakery, make a parking space available right in front of it. <laughs> and sure enough, Right in front of the bakery, there was a perfect parking spot on his third trip around the block. <laughs> now, we laugh at that, but the reality is all of us have made decisions with some kind of rationalization, maybe not as, as, as obvious as this one, but something that we've decided and then called it God's will. We've all done that. Here's another one. M uh, many of you probably know this one. It's an old saw a guy, the guy who, about the guy who wanted some guidance, so he decided to open the Bible just to, uh, to consult the Bible, he said, but actually it wasn't consulting because actually all he did was open it and let it drop open. And then he read what it said. And what it said was Judas went out and hanged himself. Well, that didn't really apply to his life, so he closed the book, decided to try a second time, dropped the book open, and where did it fall? You go and do likewise. Well, that was really disturbing, so he said, I'm going to try a third time. Surely the Bible's going to give it to me the third time. So he opened the book up, and this is what he read. Whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. <laughs> that is not common sense. Common sense is a gift, and we need to treasure it. The third consideration is your own experience. How have you acted in the past when you were faced with a choice? Situations circumstances, maybe you thought them, maybe you didn't, but how did you act, what did you choose, and did you get the result that you wanted? When we think about God's will, often what we think is God's going to give me this answer right here, this is going to be it, and this is what I'm going to do. It's kind of like a directive, a step-by-step -step manual to making the right choice. 
because claiming certainty makes us feel better. So we can find something that makes this is God's will, and we do it, then we feel better about ourselves and our life to go forward. But we all know that many, perhaps most of the choices that we face every day are much more complex and much more fluid. That often does not work in the long term. It satisfies you that day. I've got it right this time. But long term, often not. Finally, there is the counsel of fellow Christians. Now, if we consult anyone about God's will for our life, which most of us do not do, but if we do anybody, usually it's to folks who are just like us. They think like us, they act like us, they have the same views, and so we feel comfortable seeking them out. But Christian counsel is more than that, if you use the New Testament understanding. It means to seek out somebody who knows us, knows our gifts and capabilities, and our weaknesses, and has developed some spiritual maturity. Then we might get some counsel that would be worthy. It's probably not helpful to consult folks who claim certainty and absolutism about every decision of you're going to make, that this is what was God's will and this is not, for everyone and everything. And yet with either, even all these four, prayer and scripture and common sense and reflections on our own experience and Christian counsel, it still can be a bit fuzzy. And when that happens, we have an opportunity. We can begin to allow the realization to come that God's will for us is more of a direction than a directive, more an orientation that characterizes our life. We can let go of the fantasy of ever knowing with absolute certainty precisely what is God's will and be humble about our choices. Even the most powerful revelation that satisfies in one instance will not solve all life's problems or all of our moral issues. Consider Paul. He was a devout religious person. He believed it was his duty to oppose everyone who didn't agree with him. But God got through to him in a deeper way. I don't know how, miracle we know, and he realized that what he thought was God's will was actually not. He was greatly humbled. He closeted himself, actually. Paul did not turn immediately from a persecutor of the faith to a fierce champion of the faith. It took years for him to integrate this new, radically different understanding of the will of God. And even more time for him to be able to respond in loving ways toward others. All the while, from the moment of, of that road on Damascus issue, all the while, he's breathing in the grace of God. Grace of God, grace of God. And that is why grace is the central theme of his New Testament writings. I have some strong political views. And I, li I like to think that they're God's will. And I base a lot of my daily decisions on those views. I'll bet most of you here have very strong political views too. And you too base many of your daily decisions on that backdrop of those views, believing that somehow they are God's will. But what if I am wrong about some of them? What if you are wrong about some of them? It seems to me that we can hold what we believe fervently, but not absolutely. The Christian life, after all, is a life of faith, not a moment in time. I shared it in a previous um, sermon experience that I, I'm an adult convert, and I had that kind of Damascus experience, you know, and the temptation was when I had it, I'm in, I'm saved. But obviously, over time, I realized that there was a whole lot more that I needed to learn. The Christian life is a life of faith. It's not merely the espousal of a creed. We know from the New Testament, the word sozo means salvation, and the verb means to be saved. But most of the times in the New, Te New Testament, it's not as you were saved. It is mostly you are being saved, not simple past tense, but continuing present tense. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13, now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, 
Even at our best, our spiritual sight is only partial and limited, like looking to the bottom of a glass. We will never in this life have complete certitude about any one choice. Even science does not claim certitude. The word science simply means the search to know. And what is true in science today may not be true scientifically tomorrow. Paul gives us a word. Finally, he says, whatever you do, assuming that we are going to do something and not be the negative and just sitting and letting the world pass by, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. We are responsible for using our best judgment, a judgment to be exercised in faith-filled fearlessness, not in dread of making an error, for surely we will at times, and not being so absolutely sure of any one choice that we call it gospel truth. There are a lot of folks these days who claim to know God's will absolutely not only for themselves, but for the rest of us. However, Christians live not by the rightness of our choices, but by the grace of God, the unbounded, unsurpassable mercy of God through the salvific work of Jesus. God loves us with a love that casts out fear, that makes us response-able. God grants us freedom and asks us to freely choose, knowing ahead of time there are going to be some right choices and some wrong choices. It is not the wrong choice necessarily that is contrary to God's loving will. It is the fear of making a choice at all, to be governed by fear. That's what's contrary to God's will. Or to believe that our choice is gospel truth. And that also is talked about in the Bible a lot. Discerning God's will then is a matter of growing increasingly sensitive to the evoking love of God. Beautiful hymns this morning, by the way. Thank you, singers. Beautiful songs to draw us to God. Now, are there some opinions and beliefs that you held, some choices you made in former times that you would not make today? I won't ask for a show of hands. I'm, I hope it's true of everybody. At that time, you might have felt certain that this was God's will, but you no longer think that. You no longer believe that. If that is your experience, and I hope it is, this is evidence that your faith is growing, that you are growing more to the sensitivity of the love of God. Remember, God's will is not a place, but a condition, not a directive, but a direction, not a when or a where, but a how. And finally, these are two questions that I always ask myself. Is this the loving choice or the fear choice? Is this the loving choice or the fear choice? And the second question, who gets the glory if I make this choice? Who gets the glory? May we have the courage of the saints who've gone before us to listen to God closely enough to discern at least a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of God's will for our life, and then, like Jesus, have the will to respond to that understanding at that time, that place, knowing that we are always undergirded by the grace of God. Amen. go to a time of prayer, and I know there are some concerns, but I also know there are some joys. So let's talk about joys. Well, first of all, I could say it, but I'll let the grandparents announce it. <laughs> you want to say it? First time, first time. Does anybody remember what it was like to be a grandparent for the first time? Yeah, it beats parenthood, right? I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, are there other joys? Oh, come on, you lived a week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Colorado. <laughs> yes. Being with your family in Hawaii, okay, I'm going to ask you all to speak really loud because I'm deaf, I'm dense and deaf, okay. Being with family in Hawaii, wow. Okay, other joys, yes. 
Say it louder, honey. You want to pray for the orphans in India? We're going to ad definitely add that to our concerns. Thank you. Orphans in India. Okay, other joys? I saw another hand. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Montrose, okay. A lot of smiles, I see. Yes. Oh. For being a grandparent and being the baptizer, right? Okay. Other joys? Okay. Yes. Yes, answer to prayer. Yes. Mark and I were not here when you all got the announcement, but we celebrated over the mile, shall we say. Okay. Okay, now, concerns. What concerns are there? Well, obviously, there's the fire in the, um, some of you may not know because I just learned, the fire in uh, the home of a neighbor of the bakers, and evidently the house burned down. So that's a real sad, real sad thing. And then also for the orphans in India and for the, for the family of Merrill Kaufman, yes. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, other concerns? Okay. Imagine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Loud. Niece Connie having gla ball gla gall bladder. Okay. Niece Katie. And was there a hand in the back? Okay. Okay. Let us move to uh, a spirit of prayer. I'm sorry, yes. But it's real to the people there every single day, yeah. yeah. Others? Let us pray. Wise and steadfast God, we need reminders that you are here and ever present. Help us to know this in the midst of a world that seems full of threat, in the midst of angry people and angry nations, and in the midst of our own daily turmoils. Despite all that causes us concern and fret, we offer you our prayers of thanksgiving and praise for so many blessings in our lives, for life and breath, for the ability to get here this morning, for this being a familiar place and faces, for being able to worship freely and agree to disagree, knowing to, that you have bound us together in Christ, for blue skies and long days, for friends who stand by in times of worry and sorrow, for the chance meeting of a friend or stager, stranger during our days, for the courage you give us to live out the calling of Christ, for the state of Colorado, for the city of Montrose, for the answer to a prayer for a pastor, for the joy of being with family in Hawaii, and for the joy of both viewing and being part of a baptism and being the baptizer. We give you thanks. Tensions have increased among nations, and we pray for them to be eased. Oh, God, we yearn for a world in which everyone knows that love is the most powerful and transforming force. We yearn for a world where truth-telling is more important than posturing. Gracious God, free us from all that enslaves us and help us to see inside ourselves for the reasons of our daily choices. Reduce our fear and our sense of entitlement. We pray today for all those who may be in the last days of their lives that somehow they will know your peace and comfort. We pray for all those who are ill of body and spirit, including Connie, who is going to have gallbladder surgery and for the family of Merrill Kaufman. 
And we pray for all the orphans in India and for those who serve them and for all the refugees and the displaced and the homeless and the uprooted all around the world. And especially we pray, Lord, for the country of Ukraine. Whatever is your will, help us in the whole world to move toward it in some way. We pray for Gary Hickson as he continues his ministries around the world of healing. We pray for the needs of our church. We trust in your abundance and your love and grace. And we pray as Jesus did. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our, as we forgive. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For you are the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God fill your hearts. May, th may the grace of God be in your words. May the love of God be in your hands. May the joy of God be in your soul and be the song that your life sings. May your days be blessed. Amen. <laughs>